Hi everyone! In the next few videos, we're going to look into an alternative method to exploit this KTM vulnerability. And instead of using the write zero primitive, we are going to use an increment primitive, which is basically a way to increment a value by one at an arbitrary address. We're going to see how we can turn the increment primitive into an arbitrary read primitive. Then we're going to detail how to actually use the increment primitive because incrementing a value by one takes a lot of time if you want to reach a given value. So we're going to see what trick we can use to actually make it feasible. And finally, we'll compare the write zero primitive combined with the previous mode and the increment primitive. And when can we combine one or the other and what works on different operating system versions and architectures. Okay, let's get started. I am sure you recall this ki try unweight thread function by now. And there, there was this weight block that we controlled. And then we crafted a fake owner thread. And then we had to pass the spin lock. So we needed the lower bits of the thread lock to be zero initially. So it could be changed to one in this loop. And then we would craft a fake state field to be not suspended. So we could skip this if loop. And then we would reach this write zero primitive that would allow us to change previous mode to zero. And that's pretty much what we had to do because we reached the end of the ki try and wait thread function. And so we would just return back to the vulnerable function quite easily. However, there is an interesting other code path in this function that gives us another primitive, which is basically an increment primitive. And this is shown in yellow. But basically, it's a way to increment the value at a specific controlled address by one. And so to reach that code, again, we provide a weight block and we provide an owner thread. And again, we have to pass the spin lock. But then we are not trying to skip the if condition. And instead, we are trying to go inside that if condition. And so we need to actually make the threads state field to be suspended. And then we need to set a queue for the owner thread and the previous value at an offset for that address we provide for the queue field will actually be incremented by one. It's probably worth saying that the actual increment primitive works on a 32-bit value. So you can see the use of the interlocked add function used by IDA to indicate a 32-bit value. And that in the case of the red zero primitive, it was, it was using a 64-bit value because it was using the interlock and 64 with the actual 64 suffix. The main challenge we have is that as you can see, there are three dots after the increment code. And basically, there is a lot of code that we need to deal with after the increment happens. This is so we can actually return to the vulnerable function and we don't crash or something bad happens because we do need to return to the vulnerable function at some point anyway, right? And so we will see that the big difference between the red zero primitive and the increment primitive is that for the increment primitive, because we're going into this if loop, we actually need to set lots of fields in the case thread structure. So the owner thread is valid. And we have to do that because of all the stuff that are happening after the increment primitive. Also, it's probably worth noticing that we might want to turn this increment primitive into an arbitrary write primitive. So we can write any value we want to any address. And so one way to do that would be to chain several fake increment k elements and trigger this increment primitive several times, because then this would allow us to write any value to any address we want. And so this is the list of function calls that we need to go into in order to reach this ki try and wait thread. So going from ke res mutex up to this function. But we can see that other functions are actually being called after ki try and wait thread. And this is because after we reach our increment primitive inside ki try and wait thread, our phase thread, remember the wait block thread, 
like the owner thread from the previous slide. So this thread, this fake thread will be added to a list called deferred ready list head. And the problem is that this ki process thread waitlist function will be called and a thread might be prepared for scheduling, which we don't really want because it adds other complexity. Remember that the code is passing our fake case thread structure from userland and our increment primitive has already executed in this function. So we are not interested in trying to construct a real thread that will actually run. Our goal is just to exit and return to the vulnerable function TM recover resource manager as soon as possible. And it turns out by setting lots of fields in various fake userland structures up to the ki request process in swap function that is called, we are actually able to return all the way back into ke redis mutant and back to the vulnerable function without scheduling a new fake thread, which to be honest is a big relief. And so this diagram shows all the structures fields you need to have in order to reach that increment primitive, but most importantly, how to survive after this increment primitive is executed. So similarly to the right zero primitive, we need to set a K mutant object into the K enlistment. And this K mutant has a weight list head that points to a K weight block. But now, instead of just having the thread field being an address that will actually be used for the right zero primitive, we need to craft a fake K thread structure and have lot of its fields set to random, like not random, but like specific values. And we need that K thread to point to another K weight block and a K process structure as well. And now the Q field indicates what address is actually used for the increment primitive. So by setting U to a specific address, we can increment the value at that specific address. I guess one thing worth saying is that we also name our increment primitive a limited write primitive, like LWP. And so, yeah, so the increment primitive enlistment, we call it the LWP enlistment as well, because it gives us a limited write primitive which in our case is just an increment by one. This diagram is here to remind us what kind of primitive we have in, in the vulnerable function with the fake user and K enlistments and the use of trap enlistments. So the kernel is just looping over this next same RM flink pointer in the trap enlistments indefinitely. And at any time we can inject a new enlistment that we call a primitive enlistment. And it gives us the opportunity to do things. And so this primitive enlistment can be any type of enlistment. We used it for a leak enlistment, a right zero primitive enlistment. And now we know we can use it for an increment enlistment, like the limited primitive enlistment. And so now that we have this increment primitive enlistment that gives us an increment by one primitive, we can chain several of them in order to increment the value at a given address as many times as we want. And so one big constraint we have to deal with if we actually want to be able to use this increment primitive is that we need to know the original value stored at the address we want to modify. So we know how many times we need to increment it more in order to reach the value we want to target. And so immediately we need an arbitrary read primitive before we can even use this increment primitive. It is basically the chicken and egg problem, right? Except there is one case where we don't really need to know the value beforehand is if we actually know the original value of certain fields in some kernel structures that we know the address of and we modify these fields to build a read primitive by just blindly e incrementing certain fields. Because yeah, if we already know the original values of certain structures fields in the kernel, then we don't need any leak or whatever, because we just know the values like default values. And then we can just blindly increment them 
to the value we want without requiring to read them in the first place. And so if we find certain structures we can abuse in such a way that would give us an arbitrary read primitive, then that will be good enough to use the increment primitive for other addresses we don't know the address of initially. The only two kernel objects we know the address of initially are the case thread and k resource manager. And so if we could actually build an arbitrary read primitive based on one of these objects and using our increment primitive, that would be enough. And so before you move to the next video, if you want to have a look at both of these structures in Virgilius and try to find one way to build an arbitrary read primitive, that's actually a very good exercise because this is the kind of problem we have to solve all the time in exploit development.